Okay, my friends, so we left off talking about the physiological factors that influence body weight. Um, and it's important to remember that it takes a while for the brain to realize that you have eaten. So hunger and satiety are messages the brain sends and receives based on blood levels. Um, so it's important to remember that it takes a while for this to happen. So if you look on page 382, they talk about hunger and satiety and some of the different um, specific chemicals that the body produces, including hormones, to help signal the body when it needs to get things into it. Uh, the first one they talk about is leptin, and another one is ghrelin. There's other substances called peptide YY or PYY, and then there's different um, messages that actually get sent out um, from fat cells from brown adipose tissue, which is more of a surface adipose tissue, which men to tend to have more of. Um, traditionally, adult humans tend to have very little brown adipose. Again, men tend to have more. And there's evidence in that uh, brown adipose tissue um, is sending out messages to help people with higher BMIs um, or, or increase their BMI because of this tissue. Um, again, men tend to have more brown adipose tissue than females do. So, and there's another um, hormone secreted by the digestive system called cholecystokinin or CKK and these substances are going to help with signaling the nervous system whether you should be eating or not eating. Other factors include blood glucose levels. Blood glucose levels will rise and fall based on what's in your um, digestive system. So if you've eaten a meal and you're starting to break down substances, carbohydrate substances, and then absorbing those into the circulatory system, blood glucose levels are going to rise. And those, again, are some of the physiological factors that the nervous system needs to know whether it needs more or is done. Stretch mechanisms like stomach expansion and stretch receptors in the stomach can also signal the central nervous system as to whether you've had enough. Uh, nutrient absorption from the small intestine, increasing different blood levels, circulating blood levels of things like glucose. Endorphins, which are released when chemical changes occur in the body. And something called neuropeptide Y. So leptins, described in your book on page 383, um, hormones produced by fat cells that cause reduced food intake. Again, signaling the nervous system and say she centers in the central brain regions that you've had enough. Um, a lot of drug companies are studying things like leptins to help reduce weight or induce weight loss in patients. And leptins, when they're injected into overweight mice, can actually decrease body fat in mice. Um, leptin is controlled by a gene called the OB gene, um, probably named for obesity. And they have found that mutations in this gene in mice causes reduced levels of leptins. And in these particular mice, um, it leads to an increased food intake and reduced energy output, which leads to obesity in these mice. So lots of drug companies who are trying to target um, uh, overweight patients and trying to produce obesity drugs are looking at these genes to see if they can target it or create a drug that might be able to increase leptin production or mimic leptin for the central nervous system. So the role of leptin in humans and obesity is definitely a great place to study. Ghrelin, which is a protein that's made in the stomach, uh, acts like a hormone 
and it plays a very important role in appetite regulation by actually stimulating your appetite. So letting your body know that it needs to take in nutrients that are starting to get low on. Um, again, some of these proteins like uh, ghrelin are being studied because ghrelin levels appear to increase after weight loss and ghrelin levels may have something to do with the fact that people who tend to lose weight do end up gaining weight back at a higher percentage than we'd like to see. So um, some researchers are speculating that this factor might explain why people who have lost weight have difficulty keeping weight off because they have a problem controlling ghrelin levels that are being synthesized uh, by the stomach. So again, a target of drug companies. If they can help to um, regulate ghrelin levels, they might be able to decrease appetite stimulation. The other one they talk about is something called peptide YY, again produced by the gastrointestinal tract, is a protein and released typically after meals in amounts proportional to the energy content of the meal. So if we have an, uh, a meal with a lot of calories or a lot of energy content, we tend to increase lar or secrete larger amounts of this peptide. Um, decreases appetite, inhibits food intake. So again, if I can create a drug that mimics the actions of peptide YY, I have myself some money in the bank. So produced by the gastrointestinal tract is going to decrease appetite as chemical changes occur in the gastrointestinal tract when chyme is produced. And obese people tend to have lower levels of this when fasting. So again, if I can create a drug that would mimic, the, mimic peptide YY and decrease appetite, that might also decrease food intake in patients. Um, brown adipose. Again, this tissue has more mitochondria than white adipose. And if I have lots of mitochondria, I can make lots of ATP. So it can increase energy expenditure by uncoupling the oxidation of ATP production, according to your textbook, and increase energy production. So we find it typically in more significant amounts in animals and when we are younger. Again, brown adipose tissue also is a more surface adipose tissue and we tend to find more of it in males than in females. Um, it's one of the reasons why my husband gives off lots of heat and I like to hang close to him in the wintertime. Um, food choices. Composition of a person's diet should remain balanced. And we talked about uh, food choices in a balanced diet throughout this course. Hunger versus appetite. Are they the same? Hunger is a physiological drive or need to eat. But many times we don't eat because we're hungry. It, we eat because we have an appetite, which is a little bit different. And that's an actual physiological desire to eat. Often it's in the absence of hunger. So if we really stop and think about when we eat, and we've sort of been programmed to eat our three meals a day at our designated times, whether we're really hungry or not, or that looks really good, I think it's probably time for me to eat, is more appetite talking than actual hunger. And I think that many times if we pay attention to our bodies, and eat when we are hungry rather than when we're told we're supposed to eat, uh, we might not have as much problems with obesity in this country. The next thing the book talks about is cultural and economic factors that also influence our choices and body weight uh, customs in different countries. 
changes in work and leisure activities have greatly had a great effect on body size through the years. I'm going to talk a little bit later on in the chapter about activity levels and how they've changed throughout the years. And I'm trying to find the page right now. If we look at the graph on page, sorry, it's taking me so long. It's in the um, in-depth section after the chapter. It's figure one on page 405. We see an increase in childhood and adolescent overweight from 1963 to 2006. And if we think a little bit about our work and leisure activities and how they've changed since the late 70s and early 80s, we can understand how they influence our body weight. Larger body size is acceptable in some cultures and the cultural norm. Uh, lack of access to health care and health information. Not being an informed consumer with respect to nutrition can also have an effect on our weight and our size. <clears throat> Lack of access to positive role models. If that's what everybody else is doing, I'm going to be doing it too. Personal safety issues. Transportation issues. Availability of products to certain socio socioeconomic groups of people. Psychological and social factors. Um, family and cultural traditions. Well, what we do at holidays what our cultures do at holidays or to celebrate and many times food is involved in that as well. Promotion of overeating. Uh, if you've gone to a restaurant lately, portion size has been overblown throughout the years and most people choose restaurants based on portion size. That's a great restaurant. Why is it a great restaurant? You should see the size of the plate I get. So um, that is definitely promoting overeating. And when somebody goes out for a meal and they pay for that meal, they feel sometimes obligated to eat that meal even though it's much too large. Holidays and celebrations also tend to have more food than necessary. And again, being from an Italian family, there's always way too much food at holidays and celebrations. Also easy access to foods with really high fats. The dollar menu at McDonald's, for example, cheap and high in fat. Also, uh, you know, back to that diagram on page 405, less physical active lifestyles. Um, more jobs are computer-based jobs where I'm sitting in front of a screen rather than out in the field tilling the land or you know, moving boxes and um, social activities are definitely slowing down as well as far as movement goes. And societal expectations of the perfect body. We talked a little bit about this in class and Angelina Jolie on the front cover of every magazine you see at the supermarket. So. That has an influence as well. Now, in order to achieve and maintain a healthful weight, um, whether I want to lose weight or gain weight, it's important for me to do that with a gradual change in energy intake. Changing energy intake too drastically can be harmful to the body. Regular and appropriate physical activity especially for patients or people who are obese or morbidly obese to think that they're going to do activities that someone who is the appropriate size can do right away is not realistic. So starting off slower and then building up physical activity is what they're talking about with regular and appropriate physical exercise and behavior modification techniques. Um, a strong believer that 
we can eat just about anything we want as long as it's in moderation. Portion control is also something that we really need to focus on in our, in our country. An effective weight loss should include us looking at portion control, serving size. So many times, um, even if we go down into the cafeteria, there's so many examples of um, serving size that kind of hit us in the face. If you go to the racks near the salad bar, for example, there are chips or nuts or trail mix. It's important for you to realize that there might be four or five or even six servings in those little bags. Um, so a lot of us sometimes will buy those and eat the whole thing. Well, look at the serving sizes, and that can help quite a bit. Reduce the intake of high fat and high energy foods. When we say high energy, we're not saying eat foods with a low energy. We're talking about calories and calories, calories equal energy. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about high energy foods. Regular physical exercise is gonna help increase the energy expenditure that you have and also help to increase your basal metabolic rate so that is very important to look at when you're trying to create a healthful diet. Um, staying away from fad diets, uh, diets that claim they are going to create this brand new body in 30 days, have very rapid weight loss, you should lose weight very slowly and evenly so your body can deal with the waste products associated with fat burning. We talked a little bit about this earlier in the course when we talked about the production of ketone bodies. So if I have a very rapid weight loss, greater than two pounds a week, and I don't even have any exercise in this plan, then you're losing weight too rapidly and that's very difficult for your body to deal with waste-wise. Um, if you have to buy special foods that only are available from the diet promoter, you should stay away from those diets. Typically, they're packaged, processed products that most likely are not good for you, and secondly, are probably very expensive. If there's a rigid and very limited menu, and we've talked about this many times throughout the course, that it's important to vary the intake of especially things like fruits and vegetables. If I'm not allowing for variety in the intake of those foods, you should a red flag should go up. So stay away from stuff like that. And the diets that over, uh, over or under emphasize specific narrowly defined nutrients as the key to weight loss you know, the grapefruit diet, eat 27 grapefruits a day, or the lettuce and carrots diet, for example, are things that should throw up a red flag for us. <coughs> so, as far as strategies go, guidelines for successful weight loss should follow these few very realistic goals. Your guidelines for success should be very specific. I want to, in this period of time, lose X, Y, Z. And hopefully um, a weight loss program is for health. It should be reasonable. Again, losing one to two pounds a week is what you should um, aim towards in any weight loss program. And then it should be, goals should be measurable. So um, weighing at certain intervals or measuring at certain intervals should be a way to see your progress with any uh, weight loss strategy that you choose. Portion control. So eating smaller portions of lower fat foods, lower energy containing foods reducing the consumption of high fat and high energy foods and consuming larger amounts of low energy foods that will make you feel full faster so you tend not to over consume those um, high energy high fat foods 
and again, physical activity. So it's very critical for long-term maintenance of weight loss and just muscle tone in general for your body. So successful weight loss requires you to modify your behavior. Um, eat only at set times in one location? I don't know about that one because I think we really have to start listening to our bodies and eating um, healthful amounts of food when we are hungry. Um, maybe having foods available to us so that we can consume them when we are hungry. Uh, keep a log. And you guys saw that just keeping uh, a log for a week, many of you found very helpful realizing exactly how much you were eating on a regular basis, being aware of it helps you to have success with weight loss. Avoid buying problem foods. If you know ice cream is your thing, then don't buy three gallons of ice cream and have it available to you in the freezer. Because many of us, if it's not available to us and easy to grab, won't eat it, won't go out to purchase it. So if you don't buy it and it's not in the house, that's going to help with successful weight loss. Again, everything in moderation. So if ice cream is your thing and you really want some ice cream, nowadays, even though they're a little bit expensive, there's actually serving sizes of ice cream that they sell. And believe it or not, ice cream has a serving size of one half a cup or four ounces. So they sell those portions now in the supermarket. It's expensive, granted. But if you know that's a problem food and you want it occasionally, that might be a better way to purchase it. Um, serve smooth food on smaller dishes. We have two different sized dishes typically um, in dish place settings. Use the smaller one because sometimes we can trick the eye into thinking we're getting a lot of, lot more food than we're actually getting when we put it on a smaller dish. Uh, it's better to actually eat small, regular meals throughout the day than it is to sit down and eat big, huge meals three times a day. So many very successful uh, weight loss programs that have longevity to them actually have people eating five times a day or six times a day. Much smaller meals, much more regular eating, and that works in a couple of ways, but one of the main ways it works is to help keep blood levels of these substances at a more even keel so you don't get low dips and high raises in um, substances like glucose, for example. We talked about when we talked about the digestive system, the fact that if we chew our food slowly and stop eating when we feel full, that's going to make a big difference. And again, chewing the food slowly is going to allow our bodies to pick up on these signals, these physiological signals and changes that happen during the digestive process. One of the things that I have learned, um, one very good habit is to share my food with others. So when we go to a restaurant, and I really, really would love to have dessert, if you get a piece of dessert, and share it with four people. You're still going to get a couple bites. It might satisfy that craving for that dessert, but you won't be eating lots and lots of that dessert. So share your food with others. And that's one little behavior modification that helps to decrease calorie and take quite a bit. And stay away from the bending machine. Uh, one of the habits that that I have been trying to incorporate into m my healthful diet choices is bringing my food with me. I'm going to make all sorts of neat containers now. I have one that looks like a purse, and it's actually a cooler bag. So pack your lunch, pack your snacks, and try and stay away from the vending machine, because a lot of times when you're hungry and you have that dollar or dollar fifty worth of quarters in your hand, you just want something to to eat, and you're not really thinking about um, 
a healthful choice. And frankly, there aren't very many healthful choices in the vending machine. Um, being overweight can be detrimental to your health, but being underweight can be just as detrimental to your health, sometimes worse. Below 18.5 kilograms per meter square BMI is what we consider underweight. Big increase with the risk of infections, illness, decrease to your immune system function, and can be just as unhealthy as being overweight. Again, just like with weight loss, weight gain should be gradual. So if you do an energy analysis, like the program that we had allowed you to do, eating about 500 to 1,000 extra cal calories a day is a good, even way to gain weight. Eating, again, those small, more frequent meals throughout the day might allow you to add more energy-dense foods to what you're eating. Uh, portions of nuts, peanut butter, for example, very good foods that are very energy dense and adding those to your diet in smoothies or a snack uh, can help to increase that calorie intake as well. Maintaining a balanced diet, limiting fat intake to 15 to 30 percent of the total energy intake is important too. So you don't want to increase the calories by increasing fats per se. You want to keep fats in a nice balanced range. Proteins, for example, would be a great way to increase your calorie intake. Another thing that might be deadening your appetite is if, is if you're using tobacco products. They tend to depress appetite and increase BMR. Regular exercise, and if you're not already doing this, resistance training. Building up your muscle mass can help to increase weight as well. So, the next thing the book talks about is, and don't forget to read on page 399 uh, the nutrition debate. It talks a little bit about high-protein diets and are they really the key to weight loss. Very interesting information talking about very high-protein diets. Some of the things they highlight in here is there is an increased risk for heart disease. And it's caused by foods that are included in many of these diets that are high in saturated fats. So if you are eating a high protein diet, choosing foods that are lower in saturated fats can be a better choice for you on diets like this. Um, some of these diets also are high in fat and low in fiber and people have gastrointestinal problems related to diets like this. So again, um, even the Atkins diet has revised their diet through the years and they have included more high in fiber and antioxidants and lowered saturated fat choices in that diet. So um, again, being an educated, educated nutrition student, uh, if you choose a high fat diet, think about those things when you make your, uh, not a high fat, excuse me, a high protein diet. Think of those things when you make your protein choices. The in-depth is very interesting. Um, talks about chronic diseases linked to obesity. Again, we've talked about these um, in class. Hypertension, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, triglycerides, and, and the bad cholesterol, LDL levels. Can also lead to type 2 diabetes, later onset diabetes, and cardiovascular heart disease. Uh, strokes because of problems with intravascular clotting, gallbladder disease because of overworking um, the liver to produce bile and having the gallbladder store and concentrate that. Certain cancers, typically cancers related to the gastrointestinal tract are related to obesity, 
depression, um, uncomfortable, lower activity, and just not wanting to engage in activities can lead to depressive states as well. And because of this can also lead to de a decline in brain function, cognitive decline as well. I'm going to play this little film for you. And hopefully it'll work. Obesity is a risk factor for several chronic diseases, including heart disease, stroke, diabetes, and cancer. Body mass index, BMI, is used as a screening tool to identify possible weight problems for adults. It is a measure of an adult's weight in relation to his or her height, specifically the adult's weight in kilograms, divided by the square of his or her height in meters. Using BMI, obesity is defined as a body mass index greater than or equal to 30. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention began collecting data on obesity rates by state in 1985 through the Behavioral Risk and Factor Surveillance System, BRFSS. According to the BRFSS, the prevalence of obesity in the United States has increased at an alarming rate over the past 20 years. In the beginning of the survey in 1985, very few states had data to report. Of those states, a few had obesity rates between 10 and 14 percent. As collection continued, data became available from more states, providing a more complete picture and showing a general predominance in the 10 to 14 percent range. By 1994, obesity rates had risen to 15 to 19 percent in at least 16 states. By 1997, three states had reported obesity rates greater than 20 percent. This was a trend that continued over the next few years, with more and more states reporting figures in the 20 to 24 percent range. By 2001, a new category had to be developed that reflected the obesity rate of 25 to 29 percent, which had been reported by one state, while the majority of states now reported rates of obesity in the 20 to 24 percent range. The trend toward increased rates of obesity among U.S. adults has shown little sign of improvement. This trend is illustrated by the need to create a sixth category, reflecting obesity rates rates of 30 to 34 percent. By 2005, three states reported that obesity rates had risen to over 30 percent, with a further 15 states reporting in the 25 to 29 percent range. The dramatic increase in obesity across the United States from 1991 to 2005 must be reversed to improve the health of Americans and reduce the risk of chronic diseases associated with with overweight. So hopefully <coughs> we'll smarten up and won't have to add a new category to the statistics for this data, which is pretty scary in my opinion. So obesity and morbid obesity are defined as follows. BMI from 30 to 39.9 kilograms per meter square is obesity, morbid obesity is weight that's going to exceed 100 times the normal. So if you're supposed to weigh 150 pounds and you weigh 300 pounds, you're in the morbid obese category. Five of the nine leading causes of death in the United States are associated with obesity. So it is definitely a problem in the United States and obviously um, looking at the statistics that were just quoted, an increasing problem. So a multifactorial disease is what we describe obesity as because there's many, many different causes for this disease and many, many different outcomes depending on uh, what different systems are affected at what rate in our patients. Metabolic syndrome is also a description for obesity because it creates a cluster of risk factors. 
uh, problems with the cardiovascular system, problems with the endocrine system, problems with the renal system, and so forth. Factors that can influence the change of developing obesity include um, more research into the genetics. Is there um, a gene that can help control um, genetic factors related to obesity? Uh, physiology, how does the digestive system work and what can we do to decrease or increase appetite depending on what the situation is? Overweight and obesity in childhood, um, habits learned very young carry on with you throughout your lifetime. So that um, is, a, is a growing concern with younger children in elementary school, at, at elementary school age, especially children who are being served um, meals from schools themselves. Social factors, um, portion control, portion size, sort of changing the mindset that we've gotten into that more is better um, would help with obesity. Physical factors such as thyroid levels, for example, or use of certain prescription medications can also um, help with the obesity epidemic. Uh, lower calorie, lower energy diets, regular exercise, changes in lifestyle, changing some patterns that might be detrimental like eating large meals, maybe spreading them out into smaller ones. For some patients, prescription medications um, may be the answer, or surgeries like gastroplasty or gastric bypass or gastric banding, which are described in the textbook on the in-depth in page 408 of the text. And then, as I mentioned before, um, activity levels. Looking at that chart again, figure one on page 405, the increases in childhood and adolescent overweight from 63 to 206. <clears throat> I was born way back when in 1963, and after school activities included going outside and playing, riding bikes, running around, um, being active many after-school activities nowadays and starting in the late 80s, early 90s especially, there was a huge rise in things like video games and computer games and sedentary after-school activities, watching TV instead of being out and moving around. So um, changing those things might help obesity rates go down quite a bit. A um, couple of movies here I want you to see at the end and that might be very interesting. diet drug Ally first hit store shelves in June. It was held as a wonder drug, a pill that could help dieters lose up to 50% more weight. But as sales soared, so did the number of postings in chat rooms from users complaining about side effects. A new commercial from the makers of the drugs is now on the air trying to answer the questions raised on those message boards. So bottom line, does it live up to its promises? ABC's Andrea Canning has more. I'm 100 pounds overweight. It's emotionally, it's emotionally draining. draining. I cry I constantly. Cry constantly. You know, at 24 years old, I weigh 243 pounds. For Stephanie Henderson, staying slim has been a lifelong battle. So when America's first FDA-approved non-prescription diet drug, Ally, came along seven months ago, accompanied by a $150 million ad campaign, I've been taking it for two weeks and I've already lost four pounds. Stephanie and millions of others raced to pharmacies to get their hands on what was touted as diet gold. Ally claims to block your body's absorption of fat in food. I was in line waiting for Walmart to open when Ally was introduced. 
Sales initially skyrocketed. Two million Ally starter kits were sold within the first four months with sales of $217 million. There's none available. It's going like crazy all over. But one of the biggest pharmacy chains, Walgreens, says sales did slow, and the question remains. Seven months later, has the drug really helped people lose weight? Stephanie says Ally seemed like a magic remedy at first, with a quick loss of 10 pounds. But after just four weeks, she says her weight loss plateaued, and she started experiencing some unpleasant side effects that landed her in the emergency room twice. I wouldn't have control of my bowels. I would find myself running to the bathroom, leaving meetings, um, being in the car and, and literally being stuck. She stopped the drug after six weeks and says within three months, the majority of her Ally MySpace support group had also given up. And all kinds of testimonials popped up in weight loss chat rooms. One user wrote, what they do not tell you is that you will have to take several changes of underwear everywhere you go. Others said, when they say to watch your fat intake, watch it, otherwise you will pay. I was on Ally for three weeks and followed the plan exactly. The scale did not budge. People had the same problems that I did, and it wasn't worth the expense and the trouble and the embarrassment to lose the weight. For Stephanie, Ally was not a magic bullet. Experts say sticking with a diet drug is not an easy task, not only because of potential side effects. The typical pattern for people on weight loss drugs is to go into it with a lot of enthusiasm. In some cases, people lose weight on the drugs. Uh, many people don't lose as much as they'd like, and they get discouraged and go off the drugs. Looking at this from Galaxo standpoint, I think they have a very effective business model. Do I think it will make an impact on the nation's health? The answer is no. But Ally manufacturer GlaxoSmithKline says that Ally continues to surpass sales expectations and is helping people lose weight in the long term. The company and the FDA say there are proven results and that Ally, combined with healthy eating and exercise, can yield results of 50% more weight loss than dieting alone. It's an assist. It's a way to help you get a little bit of an edge on helping to lose weight. Jennifer Erickson says her active lifestyle in Colorado wasn't enough to drop the weight, but that the combination of working out, eating right, and taking Ally helped her lose 40 pounds since April. It was just so empowering to know that Ally was a tool I used, but it was, it was all me, all my sweat in my workouts, all my good choices. And I just use Ally to help me make those good choices. And as for those potential embarrassing side effects, the company says it's about controlling the amount of fat in your diet. If you abuse the drug, if you abuse the fat intake that you're eating, you're going to see a treatment effect. But Stephanie Henderson says she didn't abuse the drug and followed the directions. In the meantime, she has given up on diet drugs and has chosen the one diet that will never go out of style. No late night snacks, going to the gym three or four times a week, getting sick to lose weight, I finally realized it's just not worth it at all. Doctors say that, Doctors even, say that even though some ally users, users won't, won't stick with the drug, with the drug they predict it's here to stay. Here to stay. The, numbers the numbers seem to support that. Ally is expected, ally is expected to make 500 million in sales in its first year, first year and that is half of the entire billion dollar diet, diet aid market. Diet and Diane, it is now overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly the number one diet pill in America. So one of the things we have to remember is what we learned in nutrition about fat-soluble vitamins and diets like that and using diet drugs like that can be detrimental. Another one. But now to the question of the morning, how in the world can you be normal weight and yet obese at the same time? It may not seem possible, but a recent article we saw in the Wall Street Journal is really stirring up quite a debate, Juju. Well, Robin, you know that we are a culture obsessed with that number on the scale, right? And we tend to categorize people as obese or normal weight. Well, it turns out a good chunk of those people who are normal weight, roughly 30 million people in all, may still be at risk of obesity-related diseases. This is a new body, is a new body fat analysis test. Woo Look at that lover fly! Yes, yes. Homer Simpson, Homer Simpson may have been onto something. Nurse, cancel my one o'clock. Your, your body fat percentage, fat percentage is a red flag, flag pointing to risk factors of obesity, no matter how much you weigh. Monica Sumter learned that the hard way. She, she lost 50 pounds, torturing herself by running five or six times a week. 
But what's worse, she discovered that even though she reached a normal weight for her height, her ratio of fat to muscle was still high. I was just shocked. I, I thought that it was a lot lower, and I thought that I was healthy. Increased body fat's not just about vanity. It can be a telltale sign of something far more serious. A new Mayo Clinic study followed 6,000 Americans over nine years, and it's revealing some surprising numbers. A staggering 20 to 30 percent of people considered normal weight still have an alarmingly high percentage of body fat. For example, a 5'8 woman like Monica weighing 140 pounds is in the normal range for body mass index. But if 42 of those pounds are made up of fat, she would actually be considered normal weight obese. And that means a higher risk of obesity related diseases like diabetes and the number one killer of women, heart disease. Particularly women with normal weight obesity were more li two times more likely to die than women with low fat and normal weight. Researchers estimate that as many as 30 million Americans may suffer from the long-term effects of normal weight obesity. Monica changed her workout and reduced her body fat percentage. Resistance training is the key. And though she weighs 20 pounds more than her lowest, her body fat percentage is now down to 14 percent. I even participated in a figure competition to, to celebrate my success. I'm going to start. We asked researchers at St. Luke's Roosevelt to measure my body fat. Trust me, I was dreading the answer. The things I do for GMA. My body mass index is right on the line between normal and overweight, far from obese, but my body fat percentage puts me at risk. For a woman of my age, the range of acceptable is 23 to 35 percent. Mine is 37. So on some level, this study points to people like me who need to be aware of their body fat. And I didn't need to take a full body scan to know that I'm out of shape and I need to exercise. Yeah. And I think most people probably have a good sense of their own bodies as to whether they are out of shape. What's more, it's not just the percentage of body fat, it's the fat distribution. For all of us, belly fat is more dangerous than the fat we have on our tush, that's the technical term, or the thighs. Um, now, doctors recommend we don't rush out and get our body fat tested because of this study. Instead, just look at your waistline, they said. If you've got belly fat, there's love handles, then it's a good sign that you may be slightly in that dangerous category in the long term. Right. Well, I mean, Dr. Marie was just here, I think it was last week, the week before, we are talking about a little fat here and there, not in the belly, is actually okay for you, but it's the, it's the belly fat. The apple shape versus the pear shape. Exactly. Exactly. Not all diets are created equal. No, absolutely not. And what they're saying is it doesn't matter what you look like in the mirror. This is not a vanity issue. This is an issue of how much body fat you carry around and in what part of your body. Our executive producer was saying he's a tall lean guy and his doctor pointed at his belly and said you know you could stand to lose a little bit but you wouldn't think that looking you would look at him and you'd say you are healthy all of your you know your blood cholesterol all that stuff is healthy but you need to keep an eye on it and it's common sense is what these doctors are saying thanks for bringing that to our attention so again what we discussed in class about the apple versus the pear shape is so true and um Fat percentage is something that you should think about. I know I'm being a pain, but here's another one. I'm Terry Moran, and we're going to begin tonight by telling you about a little noticed provision in President Obama's health care reform and what it means for you. And for McDonald's, any restaurant, any restaurant with 20 or more locations must start posting calorie, calorie, calorie counts, a requirement, a requirement already in some cities and states that's now gone national. national. Some of the tallies are eye-popping and belt-popping. Belt what, oh, what if you don't really want to know? You've got to, You've look, got to away, look away, as Chris Bury now reports. He wants an ad that she can have it. Soon in this fast food nation, a lot of calories, but I don't care. <laughs> Ignorance will be no excuse. By federal fiat, you'll have no choice but to know some of the most 
fattening meals you can buy. Eye-popping calorie counts right in your face. That the Baconator Triple at Wendy's weighs in at 1,330 calories in just one sandwich, two-thirds of the recommended daily intake for an average adult woman, half of the daily calories for a man. Not much better, Sonic Supersonic Cheeseburger, a hefty 898. Taco Bell's Chipotle Steak Taco Salad, 900 big ones. The Breast Leg Biscuit Meal at Popeye's, 700 fat-filled calories. The new requirement is buried deep inside that health care reform President Obama just signed into law. It's modeled on rules New York adopted two years ago. It requires all dining chains with 20 outlets or more to put calorie counts on their menus. This way you will have an education, an educated idea of what you're going to eat. But is the government going too far? I think if you're, if you're eating at McDonald's, you probably don't care at all. In Santa Clara, California, a local official is pushing a ban on toys and children's meals for fear that the promise of a toy car or tiara lures them into fattening food. Ten out of twelve um, meals that are associated with the promotional toys are the high uh, caloric, high fat, high sodium meals. And the backlash is already underway. In Philadelphia, protesters rallied against a proposed tax on soda, two cents per ounce on sugary drinks designed to fight obesity. Whether you drink soda or not, it's not going to affect your health, and you're going to pay. What's the trouble with these calorie counts, Jeff? Yeah. Yeah, it's needed some nightmare. It's great, you know, that's impossible to keep track of. In Chicago, Chef Didier Duran cooks classic French fare. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to massage, you know, my... Uh, Chicken with a lot of uh, butter. butter, and I can tell you it's very yummy. How many calories are in this? I got no idea. Chef Durand, Chef Durand heads an organization of independent restaurants. They are fed up, he tells us, with encroaching government regulations. They want the police our kitchen. And where do you want the police? I want the police you know, in the street. And at any rate, the chef says he could never keep a true count. In my kitchen, I put you know, a pinch of that, a little of this. It's just you know, never the same, so I think that will never be you know, really accurate. Things change. With only two establishments, Chef Durand is exempt from the new rules, but he fears the feds won't stop with the big chain. We are chefs. You know, we don't want to do politics. We want just to cook for our customer who... Uh, uh, do not have you know, uh, time to read through a six-page menu. But one big chain of casual cafes has already embraced the new law. Panera Bread, with 1,300 stores nationwide, is the first to post the number of calories on each menu item. Do you think people really want to know how many calories are in their panini? You would be surprised. We've had some very favorable reaction to that. And um, uh, the customers that want to know um, love it. And the customers that really don't care, they don't even pay any attention to it. And they hide their eyes like, God, I don't really want to know what's in there. We've seen some of that, absolutely. But believe it or not, what we're seeing is the customers that do care, they're getting smarter about their options and their picks, and they're really you know, figuring out what works best for them. The calorie counts can vary widely, starting with breakfast. We've got uh, an Asiago bagel breakfast sandwich with bacon, eggs, and our Vermont cheddar cheese on an Asiago bagel. It's about 610 calories. Right below it, you've got a power sandwich. Um, it comes on our whole grain bread with a ham, egg, and cheese, and it's only 360 calories. At lunchtime, soups are the safest bet, most of them right around 100 calories per cup. The Italian combo sandwich, look out below. It's our biggest offering. It's got the most meat and the most items. That surprised me a little bit. How many calories? Um, I think it's around 900 calories. Actually, 1,040. Customers tell us the calorie counts are helpful only to a point. It helps me to make better choices. Reading the calorie count it probably isn't going to change what I order, but might increase my guilt quotient. Since listing the calorie counts, Panera has noticed some modest changes. More people choosing to pick two. Soup, half a sandwich, or half a salad. But no sweeping rebellion against its more fattening choice. I'm looking at the Cuban chicken panini on focaccia bread. That's pretty loaded there, 860 calories. Yeah, but man, I tell you what, you can't beat the flavor, great quality, and uh, it's something you'll crave. Credit or blame for the new rules belongs to Iowa Senator Tom Harkin. 
as more and more consumers become aware of choices, uh, they'll start making the healthy choice. Now, does that mean that everyone's going to stop eating Big Macs? No, not at all. But, uh, and I think even McDonald's will tell you this, more and more people are eating salads in McDonald's than they ever have before. But will the, but will the new rules really change behavior? Since Starbucks, Since Starbucks started posting calories in New York, a Stanford, Stanford University study found 6% 6 fewer calories, calories per transaction. transaction. The average the calories purchased fell from 247 to 232. Hardly, Hardly an earth-shattering drop, according to ABC's medical editor, Dr. Richard Best. It's hard, though, to get excited about a decline in calories from 247 to 232. That's really not going to tackle the obesity epidemic. Even so, the, Even so, the National Restaurant Lobby has signed on to the new rules after first opposing them to avoid a hodgepodge of conflicting state and local regulations. Our customers who travel from Seattle to Florida or New York to California, we want, to, we want them to come in and get the same experience from cafe to cafe. Should the consumer be able to know how many calories are in their Oh my, no, they don't even care about them. They don't care. Right. Coming soon, Coming soon to, a to a chain near you, perhaps more, perhaps more you really than you really care to know about that Burger King, King BK quad, quad stacker, 930, 930 calories, calories, but who's counting? But who's counting? I'm Chris Beery for, for, for Nightline in Chicago. I personally like the fact that the, there are calories there. Uh, for me, we had a recent trip to Applebee's and seeing the calories on the menu made me stop and take a second look at what I was ordering. And I did end up ordering um, a lower calorie, more healthful meal. So will it stop everybody? No. Will it stop some? Yes. Is that good? In my opinion, yes. And we should be able to make an educated um, choice. Do we want the high calorie meal or do we want the lower calorie meal? I think it's important to give us that choice. One more. And now the war on childhood obesity. 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 It is ramping up. As we saw in an interview with Robin the other day, First Lady Michelle Obama has taken the lead at the White House, promising to eliminate childhood obesity in a single generation. And with 30% of kids in the U.S. overweight or obese, that is an ambitious goal. Our Dr. Richard Bester is here again this morning, taking a look at how some communities are tackling it. George, I went to Philadelphia, where an innovative new program, low cost, is changing the way thousands of kids eat. They're switching from junk food to fresh fruits and vegetables at the same, at the same time, time making, it making it seem very cool. At John Welch, at John Welch Elementary, Elementary School, Nurse Stephanie, Nurse Stephanie was seeing the effects of the obesity, obesity epidemic right before, right before her eyes. eyes. You're seeing You're obesity, obesity in, in elementary school, elementary school students. students. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Diabetes, Diabetes high, blood pressure, high blood pressure, asthma, asthma, asthma and, of course, and of course, the social the stigma. stigma. When you start that, when you start young, that young, they've got bigger health risks. Health it starts younger, it gets worse. But what's different, but what's here, different here in North Philadelphia is that the community wasn't willing to stand back and watch their children's health diminish. Some people feel that this problem is just overwhelming. It's not impossible, it's not impossible, it's not impossible to have an impact, to have an impact on obesity. Even by making, Even by small, making changes, small changes, you can have dramatic impact. Nonprofit group The Food Trust came in and implemented a series of low-cost, high-impact standards, standards for the school. First up, in vending machines. Only water, juice, and milk. No soda. For snacks, pick a single serving under 200 calories. In math class, students do problem sets around nutrition. And then there's Banana Day. Yes, Yes, the that's the principle in a banana costume. In a banana costume. They, were they were 25 cents a piece, and we sold over 400 bananas. bananas. The, kids the kids go for this. Oh, they love it. They love it. Sixth grader Ivana Estevez is convinced. Healthy eating is not only important, it's cool. It's cool. How, do you know How do you know if if a bottle of drink is healthy or not? Because you look at the three important things. One, calories. Two, the serve, how many servings are there. And three, the total fat. Has this program changed what type of snacks you eat? Mm -hmm. When my mom, she goes food shopping, she, food shopping. Buys, like, she buys like grapes and apples and oranges. What type of snacks were you eating then? I was eating Doritos, Cheetos, um, a lot of soda. There's proof these small steps are working. A two-year study found that this type of education cut the rate of children becoming overweight in half. 
but more needs to be done, moving beyond the school and into the community. So what's next is we surveyed children uh, as they left the store, and it turned out that for a dollar seven cents, they were purchasing 360 calories a visit. It's got to be not just in the cafeteria, but in corner stores. Now when the students go to the corner store, they are bombarded with fresh fruit choices. Watermelon, they're my favorite. Um, great, so it's pineapple. It's healthy and it's, it's, it's good. I have a lot less stomach aches coming in to me, a lot less headaches. Keep them in the classroom, and that's where they need to be. In the town's most prized possession, a new supermarket. This is the best. Like, the only place we had to get food was like Rite Aid. The Secretary Vilsack, we visited at the inner city school in Philadelphia, that is doing some very creative work around nutrition. How do you take what you learn from some of these small pilot programs and bring them to scale? Well, part of it is raising the standards. Uh, part of it is rewarding schools that take nutrition and physical activities very seriously. But for the students here, the reward will be a long and healthy life. The federal government will be distributing $700 million to grants to, to communities just like this one. But even that may not be enough. At John Welsh Elementary School, George, where this program is taking place, budget cuts force them to get rid of their gym teacher. Well, that, that's part of the problem because nutrition is only half of the equation. Exercise is the other. And when you've got so many school districts cutting back on the exercise, what can parents do? Well, you can't assume your child's getting enough physical activity at school. So you have to look to see are there any after school programs in your community. If they're not, if they're not groups, of parents, groups of parents need to go to the school board and demand those, those go to your local government, go to your, why, go to your, why, your boys and girls clubs, and see what can be done to get that activity and going. And how do they know if the food in the cafeteria is healthy? It's, it's, easy. it's, it's easy. What I did, what I, did I went to school, school and had lunch, lunch with my children, and I saw what, and I saw what they were eating. You can look at the USDA, look at the USDA website, website, website see what they should be eating. A survey by USDA showed that only 25% of schools are serving food that meets their standards for nutritious food. Only that. Wow. Okay, Rick Spessler, thanks very much. So some interesting films and hopefully some interesting information. I hope you all have a great weekend. We will have a quiz on this chapter on Monday. And again, this is chapter 11. Um, have a great weekend. See you on Monday.